Okay, welcome everybody to our NCAS uh, webinar today. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker. So today we have Dr. Rebecca Wilcox, and she's a laboratory animal veterinarian at RMIT University. And she's also undertaking a PhD at the University of Melbourne in the veterinary school within APCA. <clears throat> Bet graduated from vet school at the University of Melbourne and worked in companion animal and wildlife practice, both here and overseas. Then she joined the laboratory animal world and has been at RMIT for 12 years. She has membership by examination at the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists in two chapters, in animal welfare and medicine and in management of laboratory animals. Beck has consulted to biotech on drug and device development preclinical research models and toxicology, and also to government on animal welfare. She appears on two Melbourne radio stations to talk all, thing pet, all things pets and science. Beck lives with two small people and an unhelpful Irish wolfhound, Hilda, and a British short hair cat, Mao. Mao is sincerely interested in contributing to addressing any problem involving mice. Beck has also characterized antimicrobial use in lab rats and mice in the USA, Sweden, and Japan. However, the standout achievement of 2023 has been managing to get Taylor Swift tickets. So Beck's a bit of an example of all the different things you can do with a veterinary science degree. And today she's gonna to tell you about her experience as a lab animal uh, veterinarian and how that led to her PhD. So take it away, Beck. Thanks so much, Kirsten. So today I am going to talk about one aspect of my PhD as it relates specifically to stewardship. And it's it regards um, to preclinical research. And what I mean, or the definition for today's talk of that is any animal research that, so predominantly rats and mice in this case, that is used to develop drugs or understand disease before we actually get to humans or clinical trials. So there's this whole kind of process in, in drug development that's a little bit uh, invisible to a lot of us. And it involves millions and millions and millions of animals each year. And uh, whilst we... Me. Sorry? Are we on mute, Colin? Oh, no. I'm starting again. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me now? Yep. Oh, I could hear you, Rebecca. Okay, yeah. second time round is, is going to be better. Okay, <laughs> so today I'm talking about my PhD uh, as it relates to antimicrobial stewardship and, and, and One Health. And when I talk about preclinical research, I mean the research that involves using predominantly rats and mice in understanding disease processes and in developing drugs before you get to the point that you actually take those drugs into human clinical trials. And this involves millions and millions of animals globally each year. And again, predominantly mice, sometimes rats and, and larger animals. And it's also a real blind spot in the contribution of this particular sector or we're, we're starting to really focus on you know, animal health and how we use antimicrobials in the veterinary sector, in agriculture, in you know, plants uh, and in companion animals, dogs and cats, horses, but there really isn't anything out there on how we use them in laboratory animals. So just moving on. Okay. And my slides. Okay. Okay. Uh, so just a little bit about me. I have been a laboratory animal veterinarian at RMIT University for 12 years now. And I'm also a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne. And I've got Three wonderful supervisors, so that's Joe, uh, Colin and Mark. So this is being run through the Melbourne Veterinary School, but specifically um, APCO, the Australian Pacific uh, Centre for Animal Health. The origins of this project, this is actually a sick little rat. And I asked my husband and he said, it just looks like one of the things that toy rats that uh, my Mao drags around, but actually it's a sick rat, it's hunched. And in 2018, we had some very, very precious expensive rats, an outbreak of diarrhea, and it was killing the healthiest rat pups in each uh, litter. And so we did some extensive diagnostics on this and found we ruled out all the, the usual suspects for gastrointestinal disease, but found we were getting an overgrowth of 
commensals or just the normal healthy bacteria that are found in the intestinal tract. And this was causing the animals to be very, very sick indeed. And our brilliant pathologist decided to do some uh, culture and, and, and antimicrobial sensitivity. And if I slip into antibiotic, I'm just going to use those interchangeably. And we found that we had a lot of resistance, some of it expected, some not, in these rats that in my tenure have never received antibiotics, which surprised me and is, is you know, quite high. The ampicillin and amoxiclav, we shouldn't see resistance in this particular uh, species, Entococcus faecalis, and the vancomycin down the bottom, we didn't do any genomic sequencing to determine whether or not this was like an intrinsic inherent resistance that this species can have or whether or not it was acquired, but that would be you know another thing to look at. But it should be at least partially uh, or have some intermediate uh, sensitivity to these particular drugs, and it wasn't the case. So it was a bit curious. And this is a lovely picture of a rat bite. And I can tell you why these rat bites are so nasty. It's because they've got a lot of iron in their teeth. If you ever look at a rat or mouse's teeth, they're yellow because they're full of iron and they can literally bite through lead or fingers. Now this finger here, terrible nail polish, is my finger after a rat bite, five days after a course of amoxicillin clavulanic acid, and it's just not looking very good. And unfortunately it wasn't swapped and no culture and sensitivity was performed, but this didn't really surprise me given that it might've been an intracoccus, might've been a strep, might've been stuff, who knows but I needed an entirely different class of, of antimicrobial to get better and I still have the scar, but it took quite a while. So it's really concerning from a well, uh, work health and safety perspective. So I just wondered why, why is this happening? And looked into the literature and over 63 years that publications have been out there looking or I guess identifying resistance in, in lab rats and mice there are some 22 papers. It's just a complete blind spot. But I pulled out here some four interesting examples. So methicillin resistance first arose, I think, I think about mid fifties, and this is MRSA, it's a nasty bug. And uh, the first case in rats was recorded in a hospital basement in Missouri, some lab rats in 1975. And what's really interesting about that is that the first human case of MRSA was only in 1969. So I wonder if those rats, long paper, like long ago, 1975, and the, the authors are no longer with us, but wonder if those rats were actually administered methicillin or why that happened. There has been a bit of work, the next two papers came out of Japan, and they really looked at, and they kind of recognised it was a bit of a problem, that there was some multiple drug resistance in, as early as 1978, and then looked at VRE, vancomycin resistance in enterococcus species. Uh, but that was actually intrinsic. It wasn't, it wasn't this acquired nasty form. And I guess the most recent paper is on Klebsiella pneumoniae, which jumps nicely between rodents and humans and humans and rodents. It goes both ways. And they did some sequencing and found that these had acquired resistance genes. So the, this resistance is, is it's a thing. I had, and why? And so anecdotally, a lot of antimicrobials are used in lab and lab mice and rats, just in, in conversations with people uh, among the lab animal um, vet profession, we talk about it, but there's a lot of papers, particularly in the burgeoning, exploding area of, of microbiome, where there's a lot of published protocols using a lot of antibiotics. And this... I think also this, this diagram here, put in, it explains the evolution of developing the rat and mouse for its use today in biomedical research. So first of all, we were just domesticating them and putting them into cages and trying to keep them alive uh, because they get these infectious diseases that can wipe out entire colonies. And the next thing was the next stage, 1969 and 85 was trying to keep them healthy and uh, develop, I guess, a not specific and specific pathogen free, but fairly defined health status animals. This coincided very, very nicely with this yellow arrow here, the so-called golden age of antibiotics. 
where we were developing and discovering a lot of new antibiotics and using them for all kinds of reasons and are coming to market very quickly. Now, what I guess the inference here is that, that we had this you know, access to these antibiotics as you know in our toolkit in keeping rats and mice in captivity alive and healthy. And I expect that we were using a lot. There's not a lot documented, uh, but that may have contributed to things. And the reason why you've still got resistance today, apart from the fact I'll go into it, we are using them en masse, is that there's no selective pressure to not have antibiotic resistance genes or resistant bacteria passed down vertically from the mother animals to the babies. And it's been proven that this happens. So stuff that we might have generated in, in 1950 is possibly still with us today. We also get certain drugs will induce um, most drug resistance through shared mechanisms like tetracyclines can induce cross-class cross resistance. So just one type of antibiotic can make um, someone or make bugs resistant to multiple types. So to put some actually science behind this, uh, this is where the project began and characterizing how and why and where and what uh, we're using antibiotics in lab animals, lab rats and mice in Australia and New Zealand. And this was via an on anonymous online survey in 2020, in the beginning of. And thank you so much to Ansler. That's that little diagram, cute little kind of mouse uh, symbol there on the bottom left. Ansler is the Australian and New Zealand uh, Laboratory Animal Association, our professional body, and the secretariat were able to provide me a list of uh, all the animal facilities, rodent facilities in Australia and New Zealand. 158 facilities, we don't have 158 universities or institutes, but a lot of them have separate animal houses or facilities, and a lot of them are separately managed. So the study population consisted of facility managers who were a lot of the time veterinarians. And what we looked at was initially the demographics of the respondents, then the prevalence of the use of antibiotics, what classes were being used, how they were being administered and why, how people were getting their hands on them, and then disposal. And I'm really, really so grateful that we had a 65% response rate, which is really great for a survey. So just the first question, I guess, was how are you know are you using antimicrobials, antibiotics routinely in your facility? And yes, uh, in Australia, 72% of us are, and in New Zealand, about 63%, fairly similar kind of prevalences. But yes, the majority of us are, and I don't know why it's skipping. We then looked at the demographics, so the types of animal facilities. I apologise if these start skipping now. I seem to be cursed. Uh, when it comes to PowerPoint. And the reason why on your, your right, that graph there doesn't all add up to 100% is because a lot of facilities met multiple criteria. So they might have a production facility associated or a breeding facility associated with the university. Uh, a lot of universities had and, and private institutes had hospitals associated. And of note, please remember this statistic, in 60% of cases, those hospitals were co-located with the animal houses. So the facilities might be in the basement or elsewhere, but on the same premises. So why are antibiotics being given to these animals? The first one, so this is in descending order of uh, prevalence or reason, uh, number of respondents saying the, the particular uses. And number one is giving antibiotics at surgery to prevent infections that haven't happened yet. And a lot of the surgeries that we do in, in lab rats and mice don't require antibiotics. They're quick. They might just involve inserting something under the skin, uh, but it's not a lot of orthopedic surgery or surgeries that would, in, in, in which antibiotics would be indicated to, to help prevent infection. Gene promotion, prevention of infection in animals that have got no immune system and they're very vulnerable. Microbiome ablation. I'll go into those three because they're unusual and they're unique too. Is my mouse unique to laboratory rodents and then treatment of infection so for most people um, on the talk i suspect that prophylaxis at surgery and treatment of infection will be something that's expected and, and you're familiar with but the three in the middle are very particular to laboratory rodents 
just a little bit about why we the the workhorse of oncology research is a lot of infectious disease research actually um, are genetically modified animals particularly this little nude mouse on the right and we've got other little mice that have got certain degrees varying degrees of immune deficiencies and so they're very vulnerable to getting infection and they need to be housed in a sterile manner and handled in a in the most aseptic manner possible uh, but the reason these animals are immune deficient is that, that allows them to engraft human tumours. So then we can study human tumours, like biology of them, and, and test drugs to see if they're going to be effective. Um, now, we achieve this immune deficiency either by um, genetically manipulating the mice or we whole body irradiate them. So they go into a little chamber and we irradiate them and, and deplete their bone marrow. So they've got no immune cells. There's also... Excuse me, I just have to cough. <clears throat> um, there's also these inducible models that sprung up in 1992 and they're used widely around the world where the genes have been altered in the mice so that you can switch on or off genes and therefore manifest a certain phenotype or look at a particular gene, what happens when it's expressed by giving tetracycline. So tetracycline is generally doxycycline so or withdrawing tetracyclines uh, in the food or water. So it gives a really nice way of, of controlling gene expression or the phenotype of, of the animal. It's just really sad that we chose tetracycline. So we looked at the commonly used classes of antibiotics and, and their importance ratings. And those are the, um, these are report importance ratings from an advisory body in Australia. Uh, they do differ worldwide. And it's a traffic light system. So the red ones are the ones we just shouldn't be using. And the green, we shouldn't be using because they induce resistance, but they're the first line antibiotics that we use. And the orange, we need to be quite careful with. As you can see, we're using a lot of fluoroquinolones. In fact, about 80%, 79% of facilities are using those and predominantly in the water. And enrofloxacin there, that's actually a, a specific for, for medicosia, human medicos, uh, a specific veterinary uh, drug and it's the precursor to ciprofloxacin so think ciprofloxacin people are using colistin sulfate in water uh, we're using um, kefavicin and we're using vancomycin so <clears throat> I am so sorry about the quality of this but I think you can get read it so what's more concerning is that at 27 percent or about a third of respondents were routinely administering more than one class of antibiotic at the same time. And the ones that make my eyes water are the you know, ampicillin, vancomycin, amipenem, pretty much everything you can think of and you put it into the water to affect the gut microbiome and then study that. So there's a lot going on here. Um, I can't get my hands as a veterinarian on a lot of these drugs, nor would I want to. But these are just some of the answers and very, very varied. Uh, there seems to be not a lot of consistency. I see some shocked face emojis. <laughs> so we've had the desired effect. Uh, it's a very unusual uh, use of, of, of antibiotics and very specific to, to lab rodents. Roots of administration, and why is it a problem? Well, most of the time, it's given orally. It's given orally in drinking water. Why is this a problem? There's three different ways that we treat water that we give to lab animals. Sometimes we just give tap water. A lot of the time, if we're dealing with these immune compromised animals, we'll use uh, water that's been treated by reverse osmosis, dechlorinated water, water that's acidified down to pH three. And so you're dealing with all these different types of water and adding antibiotics at different doses, different regimens and antibiotics that are often unstable. They are, <clears throat> they are, insoluble in water or just kind of precipitate down to the bottom or they'll break down or they're light sensitive. So enrofloxacin, I don't know about ciprofloxacin, but it comes in a, a dark bottle because it's light sensitive and they're being put into water in clear bottles. So that's affecting the dose that's going to be essentially effective or available to the animals. Subtherapeutic dosing is occurring and this is because Data has been, so pharmacokinetic studies have been performed that have shown you just simply can't get therapeutic levels, uh, plasma levels of any antibiotic when it's in mice or rats. 
for a number of reasons when it's given via water. And again, it varies according to dose type and, <clears throat> and drug and the type of water you're using and how frequently you're changing the water. But also if you're treating sick animals, they often don't drink and there's a variation in how much they drink. So you're getting that inter animal variation in dosing as well. Animals are different body weights and a lot of these drugs are really bitter and animals don't like the taste, mice and rats don't like the taste of them. So they drink less water. However, it's a bit of a legacy it's cheap, it doesn't require any technical skill. And when you're talking about massive facilities with tens of thousands of boxes of, 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 of mice or rats, it's much more labor effective, I suppose, than individually dosing animals. And particularly if you're dealing with immune compromised animals, handling individual animals, not only is it stressful for the animals, uh, but to so handle and inject, uh, it's incredibly labour intensive and it does require those skills in aseptic husbandry handling. The other way we're administering predominantly is in this compounded chow. So it kind of looks like a uh, tubular dog or cat biscuit kibble. And this is something you can order and for feed suppliers and it contains the antibiotics that you want. So for helicobacter infections, which is fairly common and are a confounding infection in, in lab animal facilities will have compounded chow that contains three different drugs but most of the time it's this tetracycline containing rodent chow that's being ordered in and being used as the second most common antimicrobial and it's a really big problem in terms of environmental contamination. So we then looked at the disposal of these medicated substrates so the water and the carcasses of the animals and their bedding and <clears throat> any of this medicated chow. I was just focused initially on the water and most of the time the water that's being medicated with this 30% of the time cocktail of, of antibiotics is just going down the drain without any treatment. So no inactivation and to inactivate it, you need to either heat treat it or have it in a holding tank or chlorinate, often uh, use bleach. And actually it depends on the antibiotics. Sometimes you've got five different antibiotics in water and they all need different ways of means to inactivate. But 16% are doing the right thing with the medical contractors of, of 3%. I actually don't know whether or not they're inactivating or how that's being managed. But 81% of us are, are throwing, just, just pouring this water down the drain. And contaminating the environment so when it comes down to the medicated food uh, a lot of us are just putting it hang on i'm just going to move that and just see my color code sorry there we go oh yes most of the time medical contractors again i don't know if it's being inactivated before it's being disposed of a lot is going into the landfill so we should this is just delicious for vermin and some people just prefer not to answer or it's being incinerated same with bedding Again, we don't know. I'm assuming it's being autoclaved and that will inactivate microbes and resistance genes being carried by those microbes in the case of carcasses and bedding. But at least in, in bedding, a lot's going to landfill without any inactivation. And what that's containing is the urine and feces from treated animals. And also it will have metabolites or changed or unchanged of the antibiotics that they're being, being given. It's a big contamination issue. Carcasses, not such an issue. Thankfully, most are going to medical contractors and there'll be a definitely order club before they're being um, <clears throat> disposed of, but some are going straight to landfill without any treatment at all, or some people preferred not to answer, not many. Why is this a problem? Well, the World Health Organization has identified that contamination of the environment with antibiotics is a major issue in terms of contributing to antimicrobial resistance broadly and we've got a lovely little rat up here and what better way to induce resistance than to provide uh, these this medicated chow which is provides a nice balanced diet for the rats and other animals and wildlife but is also containing antibiotics sometimes more than one so it's a real problem so it's got massive environmental and human health implications and there was a study that showed that people actually uh, these resistance genes can in municipal tips
can actually be aerosolized and can actually travel kilometers and people can can be exposed to them that way but also rats and mice that consume vermin that consume or things with wings that consume these this chow or are exposed to these genes microbes bedding etc they can also travel a fair distance and spread resistance that way the other thing is a lot of these drugs have incredible half-lives in the environment. So enrofloxacin, ciprofloxacin will last nine years before it starts to break down. Again, apologies about the clarity of this slide, but when it comes to microbiome work, this is just one page of many of published regimens that people are using to alter the microbiome. And I'll just go into... Why are we altering the microbiome? Well, we've just started to realize that the microbes in your gut and all over your body have 13 times more genes than you do, that we do as in our, in our mammalian cells. And there's this interaction. Uh, there's this gut brain axis, a gut kidney axis, gut everything axis. So the microbes in our intestines, it's the main focus area for researchers, have massive implications for health and disease and for things like the, how, how your microbiome is, is con um, constituted determines how well you respond to chemotherapy, for example. It's really important. It's important work. We need to understand the way the microbiome contributes to disease and how it affects you know, health, response to drugs, et cetera, particularly for drug development. But there's a whole bunch of regimens here and there's pages and pages of these and there's no real rhyme or reason. It's all over the place in terms of what drugs, uh, what you know, what classes are being used, how much, put it in the water, how long do you give it? Do you give it for 10 weeks? Do you give it for 10 days? I love the um, also the effect. This is <clears throat> and they're saying uh, cool item, chewing some American papers and sucrose. And they're giving the sucrose because this stuff tastes so bitter that they want the, the mice and rats to actually ingest it. So the sucrose itself and the Kool-Aid also affects the microbiome. So that's adding another variable. And there's a real resistance to changing these models. This is again from the same paper and it's talking about the pros and cons of just putting antibiotics in the water versus when they talk about germ-free conditions, what they mean is having mice that are notobiotic, so we know what their microbiome is. So you take a, a sterile mouse that's raised in an isolated environment, and then you actually see that mouse with a very defined gut microbiome. So it's removing that variable because just like in people and animals and mice <clears throat> and rats are the same, the, the microbiome varies massively between animals, which is a real problem when you're just adding antibiotics because you're not dealing with apples and apples. So research is underfunded and adding antibiotics to water is really inexpensive and it's easy and you can use any type of mouse and they do acknowledge that you may be selecting for resistant bacteria and there are off target effects things like the tetracyclines they affect your mitochondria they have profound effects on mammalian cells as well and so the emphasis is really or, uh, on, on using this antibiotic model as opposed to this really defined uh, microbiome model, which is expensive. It's hard. You need to wear gloves. Uh, what this, this diagram is indicating is you need to handle these animals to maintain the defined microbiome. They need to be in sterile conditions. The water needs to be sterile. You can't introduce any new bacteria. So it's actually technically very challenging. It's really good science. Uh, but it's technically very challenging. And interestingly, the mice with this really defined microbiome often don't develop normal immune systems. They don't develop normal intestines. It's It's got its problems as well. So it really is a bit of a wild west out there. And the reason I say this is how do we access these top shelf, you know, red traffic light drugs well, you just go to a catalog and you order colostin sulfate powder or vancomycin, just like you order any other lab supply drug. Uh, you don't need a prescription. This is a massive loophole. So it, these are prescription drugs that you don't need a prescription for. All you need is to be part of an institute university that 
has a uh, drugs and poisons license. So it's a, it's you, you can get anything you want in terms of drugs in the or antibiotics. They're all accessible. So the risks, the risk benefit. I've got the scales there, and I would like to kind of put the benefit side right down because I'm finding it really difficult to think of benefits to using antibiotics in in lab rodents at all. It's a real work health safety uh, risk. If you remember that lovely picture of my my finger, uh, shouldn't take two different classes of antibiotics to clear that up. And <clears throat> sorry, uh, so. People are people. All of us working with these animals are going to be exposed to the microbes. Some of them are zoonotic. Some of them are pathogens. Some of them are opportunistic pathogens. A lot of them are just commensals that are carrying these resistance genes that can jump between uh, microbes and might jump into something nasty. So jump into a Klebsiella or a, a Clostridioides difficile, something like that. It's a risk. It's contaminating all facilities and animal houses. And even though we use our PPE and we use very high PPE in our you know, um, physical containment one and two levels where a lot of this work is done, there was a study that just came out of, Ger out of Germany, uh, even with German engineering controls, that showed that there was a lot of cross kind of sharing of, of the microbiome between rats and mice and, and human caretakers. Humans do transfer microbes to mice. We have transferred um, MRSA to rats. We have transferred a staph aureus to mice that just wasn't on mice and it's been traced right back to a particular facility and then it became mouse adapted and it goes the other way as well. So we are a real risk to, to the lab rodents. And there was also a case recently where there was an outbreak of C. difficile in lab mice and it killed a whole bunch of them. In America, and they sequenced it and found that it had came out. It had come out as a human strain, and had come out of a, a human physician's uh, lab. Coming back to that co-location issue, and we're saying that sixty percent of hospitals that responded uh, are co-located with animal facilities. This is a real risk to patients. If we're carrying bugs that have got resistance to all of these interesting drugs that we're giving our mice and rats up to the patients, that's really dangerous. We've got the environmental contamination element. Tetracyclines are a real problem and superfloxacin lasts nine years. There's also the antibiotics have massive impacts on data. There's that variability. Even if you're just treating or trying to prevent sepsis in immune compromised animals or animals who've undergone whole body irradiation, that is affecting the microbiome. The microbiome is really important to the phenotype and to disease and response to therapies. And drugs like tetracycline, just repeating myself here, do have really interesting effects on mammalian cells and to the uh, affect mitochondria directly to the point that they're actually being trialled in, in anti-cancer studies. So doxycycline is being used to treat lymphoma. So using it in mice and then trying to do cancer studies is probably... It, it's just contraindicated and right at the bottom, at the top, but we're also impacting the welfare of the rodents. All of these drugs are used off-label. There's no drugs that are registered for use in lab rats and mice anywhere. Um, but if we keep using them like this, we're going to, we will have infections in these animals that we can't treat. So what can we change? So I've got my own kind of traffic light system here. <coughs> so... The kind of easy fixes are going to be preventing infection at surgery. So most surgeries do not require prophylactic antibiotics. And if we train researchers in strict asepsis using gloves, using sterile instruments, we can prevent infections in the first place. It's actually a legal requirement under the Australian Code, but it's something that's not adhered to very well. We can also prevent the infection in these immune compromised animals just again with strict aseptic husbandry and handling and you get similar efficacy to just putting your superfloxacin in the water by using acidified water so water that's at ph3 the mice will drink it and it also reduces the likelihood that your it, it, it stops bacterial growth in the water so 
there's also just that that ongoing education required for researchers that every antibiotic you add is a confounder, does have impacts. It's not just a preventative and keeping your animals alive. It's also going to affect your data. Gene promotion models, these tetracycline models, and there's millions and millions of mice around the world that are being used for this purpose. This is a tricky one. It's been suggested that we could use non-antibiotic uh, structural analogues of tetracycline, so drugs that will have that same effect and promote or turn off or on the gene, but not have an antibiotic effect. But then you're introducing another variable and we don't know that that works and it's more expensive. And then how do you compare the data you generate today with that new drug versus the data that you generated yesterday with the doxycycline? We can move in time towards the kind of the CRISPR and other genetic uh, models. But again, that's just kind of really the momentum is it's huge. It's, it's try, trying to stop a freight train. Uh, that's a kind of a slow process moving away from a model here. And a lot of perception is going to be it, it ain't broke. So why would you fix it? Why would you move to a different model? And again, you're not going to be able to compare that model to the data that you've got from your tetracycline mice. One thing you can do is say, look, if you have to use them, all of your substrate. So sometimes if you put your tetracyclines in water, which people do, if you use that, that chow that's got doxycycline in it, if, you know, all of the bedding, everything has to be inactivated before it goes out into the world. And you have to be really, really careful with these mice, knowing full well that you could be swapping microbes and genes with them. More challenging is the microbiome ablation work. You can said we can change to these defined microflora for our notobiotic models. And this is, there's only 12 species. And so in, in the actual defined kind of microbiome that is available in these mice, they're hard to maintain. They require a lot of skill, a lot of resources. You need to keep them in these really specialised environments. And they're expensive. And they have their own flaws. So I think there's just going to be that, that kind of pushback there Again, that education, antibiotics are confounders, particularly when you're dealing with these all these incredibly different regimens for, for inducing what they'll call microbiome ablation or dysbiosis. Uh, I think in this case, again, mandating, if you have to use antibiotics, it must be mandated that the biosecurity is absolutely as high as it can be and everything needs to be disposed of appropriately, particularly that water. It's containing all the different antibiotic classes. For treating infections, the best way to do that is just to prevent them in the first place. Uh, though, in you know, in some cases, when you do have an infection in a colony of really valuable animals, first of all, we need to diagnose it, confirm that it's an infection, and then look at sensitivity and then treat appropriately through an appropriate route of administration and water isn't it. But a lot of it can be uh, can be avoided just with the right training on handling and, and aseptic technique. So this tragedy of the commons uh, paradigm has been applied over and over and over to antimicrobial stewardship. It's nice to think that we could say in the industry, hey, you know, this isn't irres this isn't responsible and we'd like to, you know, we'd like you to, to move of your own volition to not using antibiotics. But I think that's unrealistic. Uh, people are really going to not want to change that. They want to keep doing what they've been doing so they can compare their results with that that they've done previously in their career. But we can educate and say in water administration is indefensible, it doesn't work, uh, antibiotics are not needed if we use the right technique, if you use sterile instruments, sterile technique, uh, prepare the skin properly when you when you do surgery. You know? And also antibiotics, they, they are confounders. They're affecting your data in ways that, you, that we're only starting to really appreciate now. But I think ultimately it's going to come down to governance. So big stick. And this is where I'd really like some, some input from the audience on what would be ways that this, where we're moving forward with this project that we could start to uh, address um, or, or stop this use of, of antibiotics. We're not going to be able to stop supply. We're not going to take on Merck Sigma and say stop supplying that prescription. It's not going to happen. I think... Personally, it has to happen at the institutional level, which is labour intensive, but we could include a checkbox in any approvals. 
for using uh, animals that if you're going to use, if you must use, if you can justify the use of antibiotics, they have to be disposed of correctly. And if you don't do that, then you're going to lose approval to use animals. There could be regulation at funding body level. Uh, that's, again, like a really difficult thing to change. Uh, I guess because there's other alternatives that I haven't thought of. In Japan and Sweden, they, they regulate up at the government level and they don't put things in water. And it's, it's very, very different. In America, there's less regulation, and particularly under uh, the Trump administration, things went a little bit much worse, much worse than, than what we've got in Australia. Just a lot of deregulation. Just like to thank the following people. Sorry, I've gone way over time. Um, and, you know, all of the people for helping me with learning how to use a Coltrix survey um, software and, and just supporting me in this mission and the ANS community. And I'm going to go to questions and a joke that really works in American audiences. So somebody in the audience, please get it. It's a, uh, a book from the 60s, which is really interesting. And Algernon's a rat, a laboratory rat. And uh, this was a banned book in America. And it kind of is it's like a seminal book about animal research. And this is kind of when we started throwing antibiotics, like fluoroquinolones, at our, our rats and mice. Um, anyway, I think that's me. I'm going to stop sharing. I do that. Thanks, Rebecca. That was a fascinating talk with lots of really interesting aspects to consider. And I'd like to encourage people to um, ask questions and, and where possible we can um, turn your mic on so you can ask a question that can be a bit more of a discussion rather than a, than a written question. We do have some comments from Amy Wilson in the chat. Um, so she's asked, are there differences in acquired resistance based on tetracycline administration for gene expression, i.e. food, water injected? I don't know how to answer that. It's a good question. I think that you're going to, tetracycline is generally not administered in water for the, the tetracycline models, though people do do it. They they do buy the tetracycline powder or the oxytet. I think it's going to, be going to be dose dependent. So again, it's going to depend on what kind of water you're using, how stable the drug is, how long you administer it for. Uh, it's, it's probably, it's a really good question. I, I think, am I, have I answered the question there? I think it's going to be dose dependent. Yeah, yeah uh, you have answered it. And I think the fact that it's hard to answer really um, speaks to there's not enough research in the area and it's a really important thing to think about. And Amy, I know you work in oncology and I've, I've had this discussion with you before. The fact that we have never <laughs> off-label or, or repurposed doxycycline as an anti-neoplastic or anti-cancer drug it's really problematic, I think, that people are using cancer models in mice and they're, they're giving them doxycycline. That's certainly going to be you know, an anti-cancer drug to even induce the phenotype. That's going to be having an impact. Yeah, um, and another comment that I also put in the chat, um, and I think that's a really good point, is that a lot of cancer researchers aren't aware that the microbiome affects um, response to therapy. So I think it's um, really great what you're doing. And if you're able to regulate it at, you know, the governance, at a government level, and then kind of get that awareness out there, I think that's um, really great. Because uh, most, most people that I work with don't know the impact, or, you know, don't even consider the microbiome when they're designing studies. One of, one of the things that drug companies are now looking at is even just profiling your microbiome before they put you on trial, which is kind of scary uh, because they've found that checkpoint inhibitors, which are the latest and greatest in cancer therapies, a lot of cancers, particularly uh, blood cancers, checkpoint inhibitors and you know, melanoma, that's Keytruda. Your response to them is heavily determined by your microbiome. So we may be even looking one day at microbiome therapies before you start on particular chemotherapeutic or immunotherapy regimens. So it's considered, I guess, the new first pass. So when you take a drug, you know, it, it, we used to think that the first pass metabolism, it goes through orally, goes through the liver, it's metabolized, blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. It hits the gut microbiome, it's metabolized or affected, and then it hits the liver. And so 
you're right, a lot of people aren't really appreciating the effect of that. And we know it's just such a it's such a massive area, but it hasn't really permeated a lot of disciplines in in this in the space. Oh, thanks, Beth. Sorry, Amy. Um, Kaz has got her hand up. Oh, Rebecca, that was just such a fantastic talk, and I did send it um, the link to it to the animal, all the animal um, uh, research team and animal house at um, Peter Mac this morning, and. I would really love um, perhaps if you were happy to do it to write a, um, I guess, a succinct one pager around uh, the summary issues around this that I can, we can forward to it because the animal house there did reach out to me um, to, to ask me to comment, comment on the antimicrobial stewardship. It sort of came out of the blue a little bit, but I think that there's been, uh, increasing regulation around uh, animal animal handling and and other things as part of animal ethics. So it seems to have really tightened up. But on your comments around the role of um, particularly in checkpoint inhibitors and microbiome, that is a very significant issue. And there are many um, many microbiome related human studies going on. Uh, use of FMT, fecal microbiota transplants and things like that. Patients asking for FMTs prior to their treatment. So this is actually quite an emerging and significant issue. Um, and I think people, I, I think this is a message that does need to get through. And I, I would say probably that the ability to have sort of germ-free environments would require significant investments. And I perhaps have not appreciated the the sheer volume of animals used in, in particularly in cancer research. Um, and so I would imagine that many of the um, medical research institutes around Australia would be really very interested in this. And it would be good to um, follow this talk up with something that we can send to them as a as a, a overview of the current state of play. I, I just thought it was lovely how you covered all the areas of it was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. I know hopefully I didn't scare too many people. Um so I was giving strict instructions not to. Um, it is it's just a blind spot and I I, I think it's I wonder about why and why there's 22 papers and they've come out of the same country. So Japan's eight of them come to Japan, they're onto it. And I think it's heuristics about us kind of assuming that they're lab animals and they're clean and they're defined. And I, I also think it's because it's just not a transparent industry because we're worried about lab animal activists, but also it's just we're, we're not aware of, we're not, not many people go into um, animal facilities. I wasn't aware of this until we had this outbreak and I, I it was just serendipity to do the culture and sensitivity and say, wow, why has that happened and how? Um, I think it's incredible that patients are advocating for themselves and asking for FMT. I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I can put a one pager together, but I think, and this is where, I mean, the audience can give me suggestions. I don't know anything about the behavioural stewardship or ch changing that behaviour. I, I do, unfortunately, I think, I think it requires that regulation. I think mm -hmm. it can happen at an institutional biosafety level, but it can also, just based on, work health and safety requirements under the code that governs the use of uh, animals, at least in Australia, for research purposes, work health and safety elements have to be addressed and, and brought up by, uh, to the Animal Ethics Committee. So this, the committee does have that capacity and does have that power to mandate that if you must use antibiotics and people will say they have to, that you do have to, and it's expensive and it requires that infrastructure, you do have to change the way you're handling them because the infrastructure for the germ the defined microbiome, I reckon that's 25 years away. I might be wrong. And then what does a defined microbiome look like when you start looking at checkpoint inhibitors? I mean, it's it's all very, very different, Karen. So thank you. I, I was not aware, not being a lab person, the tetracycline gene expression is obviously quite a widely used um, uh, uh, method and so that in itself um, I, it sounds like there are newer models that are more sensitive and need much lower doses of the doxycycline 
Is that been shown to change the microbiome or is that just an assumption because you're using an antibiotic to switch on the gene? Depends. The newer models, I guess I was talking more about CRISPR models, so taking out that promoter completely. Tetracycline was just a really unfortunate choice, I think, in 1992 when they, I think it's a Nobel Prize, big prizes it's for developing this model. Tamoxifen so <laughs> is another one. Great. So a cytotoxic. I mean, so that's a, a you know anti-cancer drug. So that's another one that they use instead of tetracycline for different models. I think the move needs to be away from these in, inducible models. Well, no, no. You can use other things. Uh, we use diphtheria toxin in rats to induce gene expression, and they don't get diphtheria. And it's not a problem of health and, uh, work health and safety-wise. Uh, rats don't have the the receptor to get to get diphtheria, but you can switch on and off genes. So there there are different models, and CRISPR also like direct gene editing is is another model. Um, I think we need to move away, really move away from the tetracycline models. <clears throat> yes, you can use smaller and smaller amounts. I suppose some some models are more sensitive than others, but the smaller you use, the worse the kind of you know, subtherapeutic dosing um, you're giving. And yes, it massively impacts the microbiome. And there's all these different regimens. Some people give it for three days, some for 10 weeks. Some for, um, it's it's a recipe for, I call it gain of function light work. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think Ray has a question for you, Rebecca. Hey, Beck. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, and I know you said you were trying not to scare us, but I have to admit, I am a little bit scared. Um, <laughs> But I also wanted to uh, say, I think, you know, we're, we're obviously doing work with um, veterinarians in trying to promote better antimicrobial use in, in pets and in horses and in um, farm animals. Um, and philosophically, you know, the, the sort of bottom up approach where you win hearts and minds and get people to change their behavior is that's my preference, right? Because, you know, once people believe in it and they want to do it, they will keep doing it. But I think um, it the pace of change, like you say, it, using that approach can be quite slow. Um, so you, you might need, I think, you know, attacking it from multiple angles probably makes the most sense, um, a top down and try to bring the bottom up at the same time. But my question is, do you think, um, have you looked into the role of the EPA or maybe equivalent institutions or organisations in other countries in mandating the um, the disposal processes from um, hospital or all these, these animal laboratories? Is there a role for that, that kind of um, organisation? You're on mute, Beck. You're on mute, Beck. We can't hear you. There we go. I wasn't. So it's funny that you mentioned the EPA specifically with the American survey where uh, <laughs> they were saying that the EPA was doing nothing specifically on this issue. In fact, they were dumping cytotoxics into landfill, so any cancer drugs with no. Uh, <laughs> again, <laughs> call me cynical. I mean, there's big machines of government regulation, Uh Ideally, that would be that would be fantastic if there was a way of mandating that or reaching out to them and saying, look, we need to change things. But I don't know where what the instrument would look like. Uh, I think the bottom up and top down approach, so meet in the middle, uh, would be great. But I'm I'm going to be realistic here. Researchers are on funding cycles, they've got to get papers out. Uh, it's antimicrobial stewardship is going to have be a nice to have. Thanks. Okay, we're getting close to time. Um, have we got any more questions? Any burning questions? I think um, I, I have one comment that with, with some journals that we publish in now, you have to, there's an antimicrobial stewardship um, sort of clause that you have to um, meet to be able to publish your work and so I, I think perhaps this needs to be a criteria for animal ethics applications that that there has to be some um, section specifically dedicated to justifying why antimicrobials should be used for this work and that the benefit for this research outweighs the risk of the, the resistance that will be created but I don't know how you how you leverage to get that included into animal ethics processes. Yeah, 
I think I think could the next thing would be to pick a group of animal ethics committees and get them to include that kind of clause. So the only way you're going to say the benefit outweighs the risk is by having mandating appropriate disposal of the antibiotics. Um, in my opinion, there's no be the benefit will never outweigh the risk risks unless you've got a proven infection and it's a welfare thing. Uh, or you're doing something like orthopedic surgery, and it's a good idea to have prophylactic antibiotics. Um, so yes, I, I think the thing would be to have essentially maybe pick five AEC and ethics committees and introduce that as a pilot program. And there will be pushback because it's really it's difficult to treat this. You know, it's going to be expensive, um, but it does need to be going into a clause, and I think that is the lever. That's a gatekeeper and the Animal Ethics Committee has power to approve or not approve applications or suspend them. Yeah, and I think it at least makes them think about um, if they have to write a justification, then it hopefully it forces people to think about um, the consequences. Um, but, yeah, I agree. It's not going to be the easy solution. Not that there is one, but, um, yeah, just as a, a first step. But... Um, We'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Beck. It was really interesting. Um, if anyone has any questions that haven't been answered, sorry, got a child in the background. Um, if anyone has any questions that haven't been answered or want to reach out to Beck, then um, you can contact us at NCAS and we can put you in touch. Um, and I'm just going to turn my mic off before my six-year-old melts down. <laughs> Thank you for a party, those party. What are those? They look like ice cream cones with like streamers. I like that. Party hats. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, we've got one raised hand from Kim immensely. I've just given Kim the functionality to unmute if you'd like to ask her a question or maybe it was just an error, but thanks so much. Beck, we really appreciate you joining us today. Um, thanks. We had a, over 50 people online, not including like all our panelists and team members. So um, just goes to show that there's a great interest um, in a one health approach to stewardship, not just the vet space and the hospital space. It all comes together. Um, a reminder that next month for Journal Club, it's a digital health focus. Um, so keep your eyes out in our newsletter for September. There'll be some more information about that and also our plans for any microbial awareness week and the activities we've or educational webinars we have for that. So um, thanks again, everyone. I'll stop the recording and yeah, um, this recording will eventually be made live on, the, um, live on the NCAS website in the coming weeks as well for those that want to rewatch. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.